Next, we get around to tell the story of the Christopher Inn and its innovative design. Then, Jeff Darby explores Columbus Landmark's 10 Most Endangered Buildings list. And then, we'll learn about a Packard and a President at the Ohio History Connection. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by at American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications, think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. A city skyline is one of its most readily identifiable features. It's unique, like a signature or a fingerprint. But even unique, iconic buildings don't always escape the wrecking ball. Take the case of the Christopher Inn. The architect of the building is noteworthy, and as for the design, let's just say what goes around comes around. Today, we're at the Top Steakhouse on East Main Street in Columbus. It's a true mid-century throwback where little has changed since the doors opened in 1955. Over the years, the Top Steakhouse was the place for Columbus movers and shakers to discuss business while enjoying a steak and a few martinis. This is the perfect spot to talk about the iconic mid-century hotel, the Christopher Inn. Built in the mid-1960s, this spectacular 14-floor cylindrical building was located on East Broad Street in the heart of downtown Columbus. To fill me in on the history of the Christopher Inn, I've invited Sarah Carlsberger, whose father and grandfather's company was Lewis Carlsberger & Associates, the architectural firm that designed the Christopher Inn. Also joining the conversation is Denise Ransom, daughter of Leon Ransom, one of the architects who worked on the Christopher Inn, and Bob Loversidge, the current president and CEO of Schooley Caldwell, a local architectural firm founded in 1944 and still going strong today. Now, the Christopher Inn is a place that I didn't have the good fortune to actually see it while it was here, but listening to people talk about it, this was a place that w had kind of a mystique to it. What, what kinds of memories do you guys have, especially with the family connection to the building? Sarah? It was somewhere that our family spent a lot of time. We would just pack up and, and spend the entire weekend there. Dad's office was close by, so he'd leave us at the hotel. and. It was just a, a marvelous place and fun to explore. Denise, you have also a strong family connection to the Christopher Inn. What kind of memories do you have of being there or hearing about it from your dad? I remember from the beginning him talking about designing a round building. And as, I mean, maybe I was four or five years old, it's a hard concept. You're learning how to draw at that age. Mm -hmm. And buildings are square. Mm -hmm. And I had always seen his buildings square, rectangulars. I visited a lot of the projects he worked on. So I remember when we went to the groundbreaking. I remember going over there when it was a hole in the ground, watching the cement pours, mm -hmm. different stages of the interior coming alive, mm -hmm. and then of course the opening. To me it was you know, like watching a tree grow. That building had panache, you know, it was it's the only one of its kind in Columbus. I came here as an architecture student about Oh, after maybe it had been built for five years, I think. So 
it was one of the places we would visit just because it was different and it was contemporary. The round swimming pool and, mm -hmm. the, and the lounge. Even the furniture was kind of integral to the design and vice versa. Many of the furniture items were round or chairs that spun. There was even individual sculpture in the room and wall hangings and tapestry and different interesting things that made it different than just a hotel room. Part of it, it was just a, such a departure from the traditional architecture that we were used to at that time. So the finishes were brighter and the lights were unique and there was lots of glass and aluminum. So it was a, it was a breakaway from the very staid traditional downtown hotels like the uh, Great Southern would have been at that time, or, or the Deschler, which was still there. After the war, we kind of rejected a lot of the, the past and started building for the future, and this building was an example of that. Okay, it sounds like it was a fascinating place, and who, who would go there? Who stayed there? What kinds of people? I suspect it was a premier downtown hotel, so yeah. probably business people coming into town, government people coming into town. It was touted as being close to the airport even at that time, mm -hmm. though yeah. really it isn't all that close. It was a fairly direct route to the airport. And, of course, the name, the Christopher Inn, was from St. Christopher, the patron saint of travelers. So it really was billed toward probably business folks, as you said, and people coming into town, but people that I talk to today, their remembrances, oh, I went to a wedding reception there, or we spent our honeymoon there. So it was something special to go and experience, not just somewhere to stay. It wasn't a huge hotel. It was only about 140 rooms or something like that, which is what today we would call a boutique hotel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And music was a part of it, too. Oh, there was the yeah. round lounge downstairs, a sunken lounge where the Bob Allen Trio would play quite frequently, most every weekend. So that was part of it. had entertainment value as well. You've got to show yes. the oh, picture yes. yeah. of the, the plan to expand. There is going to be this huge addition with a rotating restaurant at the top, mm -hmm. very similar to the to the like space, space needle, needle in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine if we had that today? Oh. It, would be, it would be a real landmark. Yes, yes, it would. I think it would have made downtown Columbus a completely different yeah. place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was actually a full-scale model that was probably six feet tall. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that. Oh, model. yeah. I don't remember it was where. huge. It was, it was in the offices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that part never happened, but at any rate, they, they build this hotel. It's successful for a while. Mm -hmm. Then it starts to kind of go downhill. There were financial issues. I think that and had to do a lot with downtown just being in decline at that oh, time. Okay. I don't know that it was necessarily issues with the hotel per se, but people will tell you, oh, yeah, they roll up the streets in downtown Columbus at 5 o'clock, and it was just yeah. very quiet. There wasn't much going on. I know, the change in the economy, I mean, and, and the, the, the movement, to the suburbs impacted yeah. downtown mm -hmm. before I moved from Columbus in 78. Columbus was probably like a lot of other cities where downtown was being abandoned. Everybody give me a final thought on the Christopher Inn. If I won the lottery, I'd build it over again. Would you? Yeah. That's, I've always said that, if there were a way, yeah. We can't afford to lose buildings that are that important to our city. We have to look around and say, look, this building made an impact. What we need to do is take a lesson from the fact that we lost the Christopher Inn, especially because it just became a parking lot. That's a tragedy. My lasting memory is uh, happiness and sadness. At a very young age, I got to see the future, and I felt like I was you know, yeah. part of that Jetsons age. You know, I, I got to see this is what we were going to grow up and see in, 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 yeah, in buildings yeah. and interiors, and was just it was it was encouraging, but at the same time very sad because. When they told me that was no longer here, I, the first time I saw it, my heart hurt. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next, Columbus Landmark's 10 Most Endangered Buildings list. Then, Mr. President, meet Mr. Packard. They say you can't stand in the way of progress, but people who love historic buildings often wonder if it really is progress when an old building is demolished. 
And every year, Columbus Landmarks compiles a list of the 10 most endangered historic buildings in the city. Architectural historian Jeff Darby spoke with Becky West of Columbus Landmarks about the list. I'm a founding member of the Columbus Landmarks Foundation way back in uh, 1977. And today we're on the east side of Columbus with Becky West, uh, director of Columbus Landmarks. And uh, you have something called the Endangered Buildings List, is that correct? That's right. Back in 2014, we published our first list of enda most endangered buildings. And we did this because our advocacy committee has been working, as you know, since 1977, behind the scenes to quietly advocate for, and sometimes vocally, these buildings that are threatened with either long-term vacancy, deterioration, and now sometimes uh, redevelopment. You're raising awareness, you're trying to start a conversation, hoping to find solutions to, to keep these buildings from disappearing from the landscape. That's exactly right. We're visiting one of the endangered buildings, which is the um, former Holy Rosary Church, a Catholic church built in 1916. It's part of a complex of buildings on East Main Street. Uh, a wonderful piece of architecture, but, but with a somewhat clouded future, I guess you'd say. And we're going to uh, stop and have a look at, uh, at uh, how things look at this site today. So this building was the school, the high school, isn't that That's right? That's correct. And this it was is, built when? Well, this is the newest of the buildings that we'll see today. And this was built in 1928, and it was used as Holy Rosary Catholic High School until I think the mid-1960s. Oh, look at that entrance. How much do you love that oh, door? Oh, the, the ironwork in the window. Beautiful. Yeah, the paired doors, it's really nice. Yeah, it is. Then there's the church, spectacular And then we building. have this incredible, magnificent church building. And it building. was built when? 1916. Okay, boy, it is a gorgeous building with the tower. It's just magnificent, isn't it? You really, yeah, you have to stand and see it from a distance. Now, what was the, um, what was the inspiration for the design? So it's built in the northern Italianate style, and then they must have loved it so much that they built the high school building oh, sure. to complement that well, style. Well, it really is. That's right. It really looks yeah. very similar in the design. The interior of the church is much more ornate, though. Mm -hmm. It's not in the same style. You'd say it's more a traditional design as in terms of sort of church architecture? Yes. You can only imagine how exciting it was in the neighborhood for oh, I'm sure. a piece of architecture like this to happen. And when was it last used? When was the church last used so, by, by its original congregation? By its original congregation in the 1980s, I believe. And uh, Rock of Faith Baptist Church has owned the whole campus ever since that Okay, time. so that organization took it over right they away did. and continued its, its use as a church. So it's yes. never really been empty or abandoned. It hasn't. Uh, uh, some of the buildings that are associated with it don't have uses right now. That's correct. Okay, so we have the High school building over here, what's this building? So this served as the convent later. It was originally built as a church and school, uh, just probably a temporary structure mm -hmm. so that they could build the big, the big church. And then it did serve as the convent on the campus. That was very typical though. You'd have a church, you'd have a rectory where the, where the priest would live, you'd have a school. And often, often the nuns in the convent were teachers in the schools. That's that correct. Place? Okay, so it really was a complete right. complex. And we're thinking about that in terms of redevelopment. When you look at this whole parcel, uh, you know, it would be an incredible opportunity for something big to happen here once again. Well, you know, you can see some deterioration in the buildings, but basically they're sound. The walls are straight. The brick is in good shape. The roofs look in pretty good shape. Absolutely. There's some broken windows, but those are fixable. That's right. And this type of ornamentation, you know, we can't buy this today. We well, can't replicate can't. this. Yeah, there's no way. Well, it's great seeing this complex. It really is an important one, but I know there are other things on the endangered buildings list. So shall we take a look at some of the others? Let's go do it. All right, back to the car. The next building is uh, known to many as the Salesian Boys and Girls Club. Most recently, it was the Bosco Center. And, but originally, it was the Knights of Columbus. So it was a headquarters building for them, a meeting hall? That's correct. I think it was a headquarters, auditorium, and an athletic club for the KFC. And it was designed by the preeminent architecture firm, Richards, McCarty, and Bulford. That was an important firm historically. They did a lot of important Columbus buildings. Absolutely. If this building reminds you of the athletic club, 
uh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it does look a lot like it. When was it built? Do we know the, uh, the year? So it was 1927. Oh yeah, that's a great building. Uh, five or six stories, terracotta trim, big brick walls, nice building. So Becky, we're in um, Marble Cliff, uh, right at the edge of Upper Arlington, northwest of downtown Columbus. What are we going to see? We're going to see the 1907 William Landman Marble Cliff Mansion. It was designed by Frank Packard for Landman, who was the um, owner, creator of Columbus Bolt Company. Aha. Uh -huh. And so he was an industrialist. He was. And built a house to sort of reflect the stature of his position in sort of the, uh, the economy and society. Would you say that? Absolutely. And then in 1935, another Columbus notable, um, William Billy Ingram, moved to Columbus to bring his company, White Castle, here to the, um, to the area. And he lived in the house uh, beginning in 1935. So everybody knows White Castle. That is quite a house. Isn't it? So tell me why this building is endangered. It looks like it's in pretty good shape. Well, it is in good shape. And the building is on our endangered list because a de redevelopment proposal was presented to Marble Cliff Village mm -hmm. uh, that called for demolition of the building to okay. make way for a new apartment building. So again, it's a case of nobody's looking at the building, they're looking at land. They were, however, fortunately, there was a very robust community dialogue led by the mayor of Marble Cliff and their village council, and many of the residents came together and they um, gave the development team some feedback. And fortunately, that development team has come back to the, went back to the drawing board and came forth with a new proposal that actually may potentially reuse the mansion as part of their redevelopment okay, of so the, the whole the site. the community decided the building's important to, to them, to the community. The developer decided, you know, these people are really serious about this, why don't we talk? So you've got to give credit to both sides. Absolutely. One for taking action, the other for showing flexibility. Absolutely. And finding a solution that really works for everybody. Would you say everybody seems to be pretty happy with the solution? We are very happy with the solution, <laughs> but it remains to be seen. It's, it's yeah. a conversation. Well, thanks so much. It's been great seeing these buildings, learning about the endangered buildings list, learning about where we are on these various projects. So I look forward to future success and good luck with landmarks. Thank you so much, Jeff. We're not surprised one of Frank Packard's buildings is on Columbus Landmarks list. We've looked at several of Packard's buildings through the years on Columbus neighborhoods. But we were surprised when he turned up on some documents linked with President Warren G. Harding when we were looking for new From the Vault segments at the Ohio History Connection. Here's more. Hi, Barb. Hi, Brent. How are you today? I'm doing great. Huh, it looks like we're looking at either an architect or an artist from what I see here. Well, we're looking at the work of an architect. In fact, the architect is Frank Packard, who was a nationally renowned um, Columbus architect who practiced in the late 19th to early 20th century. What are some buildings we would see today that uh, are associated with uh, Frank Packard? Well, you could make a nice little tour of downtown. You could start over in the Franklinton side of the river and see the Toledo and Ohio Central former railroad depot. Crossing the river, you'll see the Civic Center spread out that he was very instrumental in advocating and promoting the development of. And then downtown, high-rise buildings, skyscrapers, and also the Seneca Hotel. These are buildings we see every day when we're downtown Absolutely. and out and about in Columbus. I don't recognize these uh, structures as being in Columbus. What are we looking at? Well, they're not in Columbus, and this is the fascinating piece. As I've researched Packard's architecture and his career, I came across this document in our collections, 
and it is a personal account of a trip that Frank Packard and members of President Warren G. Harding's family made in May of 1923 from Columbus to Blooming Grove, which was the location of his birthplace and where he grew up. So what was he doing, what was he going up there for? Well, the idea was that he was making this trip up to see a preliminary uh, look at the site of what they referred to as the old homestead. And the idea was that once the Hardings left the White House, that they would return to Ohio and in Blooming Grove, Morrow County, the plan was to recreate Harding's birthplace, the old homestead, and then also build what looks to be a colonial revival looking house on the property that would be a retirement home for the Hardings. And then of course also, um, not forgetting Harding's favorite pastime, they were developing a golf course across the road from this complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You found some interesting correspondence, I think, between um, Packard and Harding. Well, this report that Packard wrote, again, it's just, it is really, you can tell it is written by an architect. It is so filled with such um, power of observation and attention to detail. It starts out by saying it was a delightful, bright, sunshiny morning, the 14th day of the beautiful month of May, with the soft, balmy breeze out of the west, with all nature unfolding. It's pretty descriptive. Right, right. Went on to say in the car, the motor fit and purring softly, <laughs> seemingly anxious to carry us to the homestead of our president. Tell us what these photographs are. Well, these are photographs presumably um, taken by Frank Packard, and they show the house and farm buildings that were located on the Harding land in May of 23 when they visited. And of course then the drawings and the rendering is what they were planning to um, recreate and build new. This is 1923. Mm -hmm. It's a significant year for both of these men. It is. And that's really where this story comes full circle. Packard makes the trip with the family members in May of 1923. And of course, the Hardings, Mrs. Harding and the president travel out west in August of 1923, where uh, President Harding unexpectedly dies. Then Frank Packard actually unexpectedly dies uh, in October of 1923. So all of these plans as they were laid out and put forward never come to fruition. Was this kind of a forgotten chapter until you discovered this correspondence? There isn't a one location where all of Packard's architectural drawings and other letters and uh, documentation exist. So doing research on him is very much of a detective uh, project. And to uncover something that's this personal and so filled with detail is really, really a wonderful discovery and really un brings alive of interesting aspects and pieces of history. It's a fascinating story that would have gone unknown had it not been for your detective work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so thanks for sharing it with us. Certainly. Glad to do that. Four three two one zero. It's one of the nation's most intriguing zip codes. How'd it come to Columbus? Find out about that story and more at Curious CBUS, where you submit a question online, and if voters agree, we report the story together. Look for stories, submit a question, or log on for a voting round at wosu.org slash curious. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods.
freezing winters in hot as summer. Spent springs at park of roses, dodging bees and skipping stones on the creek with my brother. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime, marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.